Welcome! The National Transit Institute is proud to present the friends, fans, and followers How Transit Agencies Use Social Media TCRP Synthesis 99 webinar. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. The format for this webinar will consist of three presentations followed by a question and answer session. Susan Bregman, our first presenter, is principal and founder of Oak Square Resources, a Boston-based consulting firm that provides research, policy, and social media services to the public transportation industry. She is also editor of The Transit Wire, www.thetransitwire.com, an online source of daily information about emerging transit technology. Thank you, Judy, and hi, everyone. Um, I am Susan Bregman, as Judy said, and I edit the Transit Wire, which um, provides daily updates about transportation technology, pretty much everything from social media to mobile applications to smart cards. And I encourage you to check it out after the webinar if you're not already familiar with it. Today what I'm going to do is talk about TCRP Synthesis Report 99, which was called Uses of Social Media in Public Transportation. So first I want to talk about how we did the research. Um, I conducted the research between November 2010 and September 2011, and the research consisted of three components, a literature review, an online survey, and six follow-up case studies. We recruited people for the survey via social media, of course. We used the transit wire. We used Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. And I think some of the people who filled out surveys are in the audience. I see some familiar names today. Um, the survey, because it was people who are known to be using social media, is really more of a convenient sample than a random sample. And then from the people who participated in the survey, we selected six agencies for follow-up case studies. And you can see them on the map here. The case studies are the larger blue dots, and the survey respondents are the smaller red dots. Um, we received survey responses from transportation organizations in 18 US states, the District of Columbia, and five Canadian provinces. We limited the study to North American transit operators. Um, for the cases, we wanted to include a mix of agencies, not just the geographic mix, but also a mix of large and small organizations and organizations that were social media, media neophytes and also early adopters. And both Tim Moore from BART and Morgan Lyons from DART were case study um, participants, and you'll be hearing from them later today. So what I want to do before I get to this slide is talk about a slide that I did not create um, and give you a brief overview of the um, survey responses when people talked about how they're using social media. And very quickly, the transportation organizations responding to the survey used primarily Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And they primarily used these applications to connect with young adults, students, and everyday riders. And there's clearly some overlap among those three groups. Generally, the agencies said that their primary goals for using social media was to reach existing riders and also to reach out to potential riders and perhaps increase ridership. And generally, they found social media most effective for communicating with their current riders and less effective for attracting new riders. The other thing we asked them is what they encountered or what they considered barriers to using social media. And we presented them with a list of commonly stated concerns or barriers about using social media and asked them to rate the importance of each of these statements on a scale of one to four, where one meant it was not important at all and four meant it was very important. And as you can see from this chart here, the primary concerns that agencies had were concerns about staffing and resources, concerns about being vulnerable to criticism when they were online, and also this fear that their riders do not have technology and a preference for using traditional approaches to communication on the part of the agency and on the part of their riders. So I'm going to talk about those top three concerns today. 
and they are, as I just said, we don't have the resources to run a social media campaign, we won't be able to control the conversation, and our riders don't use social media. So let me talk about resources first. We asked the agencies participating in the survey to tell us how many staff hours per month they devoted to social media on average. And then we wanted to compare large agencies to small agencies, knowing that there are differences in budget and staffing availability. So we based the large and small distinction on the um, population of the urbanized area where these agencies were. Large agencies had a population of 200,000 and above. Smaller and, r and rural were, had fewer people. And as you can see, the small agencies generally devoted fewer hours to social media per month than the larger agencies, as you might expect. The smaller agencies, by and large, devoted 40 hours or fewer to social media, where about half of the large agencies spent at least 40 hours, at least one person week per month on social media. The next thing we talked to them about was this fear about being vulnerable to criticism and this um, concern that they won't be able to control the conversation. And the truth is, you can't control the conversation on social media. You can control what you say, but you can't control how people respond to you. And social media is a pretty unfiltered medium, and people say a lot of things. And um, it's certainly appropriate for agencies to manage illegal behavior, offensive behavior, to take down posts on their Facebook page that might include profanity, for example. However, agencies that can tough it out, agencies that can be a little thick-skinned about it, can actually use social media to learn about their riders, learn about their service, um, and better understand what one of the survey participants referred to as their, their pain points where there are problems that they might be able to address. Um, it's not always what agencies want to hear, but social media can actually provide unfiltered and free customer research for these agencies. And the other thing is people are already talking about you. Whether or not you are online, people are having conversations about your service. Maybe they're frustrated because they're waiting for the bus and the bus isn't there. Or maybe there's a big incident like a derailment or a driver strike. Whatever the reason, people are already online talking about your agency, so you might as well get on there and join the conversation because then you can present your message unfiltered. And by communicating with people and responding to them, you can sometimes you know, diffuse a tense situation. Um, you may not be able to turn your critics into your supporters, but you can often calm them down just by going online and responding to comments and criticisms. Agencies also indicated that they thought their writers were not using social media. And I think this is changing very quickly. We know now that about half of the adults in the U.S are using social media, and if you just look at adults who are already online, it's closer to two-thirds. Um, young women in the 18 to 29 age group are still what people might call the power users. They're really the ones who are online. They're using Twitter. They're using Facebook. They're using Pinterest. Um, they are online all the time. But there is certainly growth in every age group on social media. And social networking overall showed very little variation by major demographics, by income, by race, by ethnicity, education, or location. You can see here the percentage of people who had a profile on a social networking site for each age group. And this does not mean they're active users. It just means they got on one day, signed up for an account. Some may be regular users. Some may have, been, have abandoned their accounts. But generally, you see the trend, you see the growth, and you especially see the growth in um, the age groups of 55 to 64, the baby boomers, and people 65 and over. So there's definitely market penetration in all age groups for social media. And you can also see that here in this chart that shows the age distribution across 19 social networking sites. 
the big ones that you have heard of, and some obscure ones that you probably have not. But generally, again, it shows a similar pattern. You see, you see representation in all age groups and um, with high usage among the um, young adults. One thing that agencies can do to help manage their social media activities is developing a social media policy. And this graphic here represents information presented in a report from the Center for Technology and Government. And it identifies some of the major elements of a social media policy that government agencies might adopt. This is based on a survey of, um, I think, two dozen government social media policies. And I'm not going to go into all of these little bubbles here on the chart. But some of the things to think about when you develop a social media policy are basic things like account oversight. Who's in charge? Is it the marketing and communication department? Is it the IT department? What approvals are required within your organization? Can employees use social media during business hours? Or is your organization going to block certain social media sites like YouTube or Facebook, for example? Who generates the content? How often does content have to be generated? Who has to approve the content you generate? What about security? What about password controls? Is your agency taking the steps to make sure that your site stays safe from hacking? Um, what about legal issues? Are you required to archive your posts, archive your Twitter tweets? Um, what are the rules that govern your agency? Um, also, in terms of user conduct, some agencies have posted policies on their Facebook pages, on their blogs, that really identify what is acceptable user behavior. No profanity, no illegal behavior, um, things like that. And um, not everyone has adopted a social media policy. In the TCRP study, only 25% of the responding agencies had a social media policy in place, but about half said they were thinking about it. And also, some agencies don't have a standalone social media policy, but many of these elements are incorporated into other personnel policies that govern the agency activities. So what did we learn? What were the lessons learned? What advice did the practitioners offer? I think the first thing is keep social media in perspective. A lot of people are using it. A lot more people are using it than used to be using it even a couple of years ago. But it is just one tool, one communications tool for agencies to use. And it is not the end all and the be all for everyone. Keep it in context. Consider your organizational impact. Make sure you get buy-in. Who has to approve what you're doing? Do you need a sign off from the legal department? Does your IT department have to sign off on what you're doing? These are important things for every agency to consider. Also, find the right voice. Social media is a very informal channel of communication. And whoever is posting information on behalf of your agency should be sounding like a person, not like some press release from the agency. It's critically important to find the right voice, find a conversational tone for your social media posts and tweets and blog entries. And then listen. Listen, listen to your people. Listen to what your constituents are saying, what your writers are saying, what your stakeholders are saying. You can learn a lot about them, what they want, what they need, and how your service is working. And then have fun with it. Social media is a lot of fun. A lot of agencies use it for promotions. They use it for contests. Um, New Jersey Transit, I just saw this the other day, just had a contest on their Facebook page to have people help name their new mobile payment app. Amtrak always is having contests and asking open-ended questions to encourage people to post information, post their experiences on Amtrak trains on Amtrak's Facebook page. Have fun with it. And just get started. There's no single path to social media. Some agencies I spoke to in the course of this study came to it with a very specific plan and started step by step to implement it. Others just kind of fell into it. It doesn't matter. 
the real and the other important thing is to keep moving. Social media is a moving target. Ten years ago, we didn't have Facebook, as hard as that is to believe. Ten years from now, who knows what we're going to have. But the important thing is not what the specific channel is. The important thing is that social media has changed how transportation, organ how transportation organizations are engaging their communities. So that's the summary, the high-level summary of Synthesis 99. And here's my contact information. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back to Judy. Thank you very much, Susan. Our next presenter will be Tim Moore from BART. Timothy Moore oversees online services for BART, San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District. He led BART's early use of mobile, messaging, social media, and location-based services. He also developed BART's pioneering approach to open APIs and established some of the first policies and practices for open government data in the U.S. Mr. Moore's work has appeared in publications such as TechCrunch, Mashable, Fast Company, and Atlantic Monthly, and has garnered numerous awards, including a Webby, an Addy, and numerous apps at Ad Wheels. BART's homepage design at BART.gov is part of the permanent AIGA design archives at the Denver Art Museum. Mr. Moore is a frequent speaker on interactive strategy and innovation, open data, mobile services, and social engagement. Thank you very much. Well, let me just get right into this first by saying, you know, obviously there's a lot of, uh, a lot of change, as Susan alluded to, going on in the social media space. Um, it's a pretty fast-moving area. And since many of the interviews that we did for Synthesis 99, or that Susan did for Synthesis 99, those interviews occurred, uh, sort of evolution in our thinking here at BART has occurred, and I'd like to go over some of that. Um, metrics for social media still don't seem to be fully baked, I think, across the industry, but we've moved from looking, at least at BART, we've moved from looking at broad measurements like followers, uh, and that kind of thing, to more specific measurements that demonstrate engagement, and uh, I'll talk about some of those. And, you know, finally, I'm going to lay out, I guess, our, our roadmap at BART overall, uh, how far we've come, but, you know, also how far we have to go uh, to really embrace this uh, social medium. Uh, so just to set this into context, and I think Susan touched on this as well, you know, all of our social media tools are just uh, part of uh, a larger tool chest of ways that we communicate with our riders. You know, at part, and I think in many of the agencies that are listening here today, um, you know, we all have websites, uh, mobile web apps. Uh, we use email and text uh, subscriptions for alerts and advice, system advisories, and that kind of thing. We have an on-demand SMS service where if you text BART delay to 878787, you'll get back uh, real-time delay information and also ETAs uh, if you want to know more about that. Um, we have a lot of open data apps, uh, native apps, and also web apps that are provided by a developer community and, and powered by BART.gov's open data initiatives. Um, IVR, blog, feeds, you know, all of this stuff. And then finally, kind of the kicker is, is social media. So. We have to try to keep all of these things in, in context, particularly if we think about content strategy, um, moving information and moving stories throughout all of these mediums and media and how we kind of approach uh, that effort. So, you know, at part our, our interactive services, essentially everything on that list, actually everything on that list that I just showed you, um, you know, it's, it's run by a two-person shop here. This includes web uh, and everything down to even the hardware and applications um, that, that we require to run these services. So with two people, we, we really have to focus on where we can be most effective. And for us, that's been Twitter and Facebook principally, um, and then kind of in a tertiary way, Pinterest and Storify, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, you know, we post a few YouTube videos every once in a while. 
Um, BART was the first agency in the country with a four-square badge, and that was a nice run. As, as a matter of fact, our train spotter badge uh, has kind of evolved uh, into kind of a generic transit badge. Um, there's just not a lot of people in Google+. Plus. And so we're, we're really trying to focus on where our customers are, uh, fish where the fish are, so to speak, and where we can tell and move our story best. Now, when this report was written, when, when 99 was written, our thinking was that social media was really a two-way medium that uh, required a human touch. Uh, this human interaction, this realness, as Susan said, this kind of you can't be a machine or a press release. You really have to engage people as humans. And, and uh, we still think that, right? Uh, social channels, uh, however, are not exclusively that. We used to handle Twitter primarily during business hours, and we made clear sign-offs. Like on Friday, when, you know, when we were leaving for the weekend, we signed off and told people that they could get service advisories through our SMS channels and sign up for email and you know, on demand and all of that. Um, but then we did some research on our interactive programs this spring, and we heard from our customers that they wanted all of our delay messaging in Twitter. And the only way we could really deliver that was in an automated way. So we created a new feed uh, called SF Bart Alert, and uh, just that was expressly for this purpose. Tied it to our developer API uh, that drives our SMS messaging, so we're kind of dog fooding our developer services, um, and pump our service advisories out in a truncated form to Twitter. And you know, we're, we're clear that it's not a human thing. Some people, as it turns out, just want delay advisories only. You know, they don't want the, the unicorns and the rainbows and the marketing stuff and all of the PR stuff. And you know, that's cool. And we're trying to accommodate that. Now we're delivering it. Storify. Um, so this is another thing. So since, since TCRP99 came out, we started using Storify as a way to tell our own story. And Storify is is really interesting, at least to me, because uh, it's a way for you to cover social reaction to a story in addition to the story itself. Um, you know, it's a way for you to bring together and arrange um, all of the cool stuff that your writers are doing, photos, tweets, videos that they're taking, and, and you know, you can kind of punctuate that with your own Twitter messages and your own uh, uh, you know, uh, YouTube posts and stuff. And so essentially you're just creating this visual, it can be, visual timeline, this narrative history of uh, a major event from a writer perspective. And um, you know, what I'm showing on this slide here is uh, an event, uh, uh, an apartment complex that was under construction uh, directly adjacent to uh, our tracks. Uh, caught on fire and it disrupted service in a major way. This was a great story for us because uh, I guess number one, the fire wasn't our fault, and number two, uh, we were able to resume service relatively quickly given the, the context and severity of the event. Um, it, Storify was a great way to reflect the words and the images of the communities that we're that we're serving, and uh, we've also used it on you know dump the pump days to cover reactions to. Um, our new vinyl seats that we're rolling out, reactions to a, a bike pilot that we did on the on the trains, and it's been a it's been a really really good tool for us. So measurement, you know, this is the kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, when this report was written, we were looking at numbers like impressions and followers and that sort of thing, and I think social media measurement has not really matured very much, and you know. We're not going to go out and buy some sort of sophisticated platform to help us quantify our social media efforts better, because those, you know the cost to benefit isn't really there. But impressions and followers is a pretty broad measurement, and at the end of the day, we're not really sure how meaningful any of that really is. Now, if you're a real business where you can track like a, a social interaction down to a conversion, you know, like. Uh, uh, some sort of financial transaction and kind of create a payoff that way. It, it, some, of this, some of these measurement tools make sense. But for us right now and for transit, I think in general, we're not going to track a social contact down to the fare gate or down to conversion. So we have to look at metrics that 
mean something that tie in with other goals and other strategies um, in our communications programs that, that we can quantify. You know, part of our digital strategy at BART is to place the website uh, at the hub. It's really uh, the focus of all of our calls to action in all of our channels, in, in our email, in text, uh, in Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, so beyond the utility of Twitter-specific real-time kind of micro-messaging, tracking our website referrals is a really great way to compare social with uh, other tools in the tool chest. Website referrals are super easy to quantify if you use a tool like Google Analytics, uh, which we do. And what I'm showing here in this slide is that we really need to keep social media in perspective. On this goal, at least, email is actually more effective in driving traffic to the website than social media. Uh, but social media still should be part of the mix. Now, I also think the tendency uh, for, for many of us is to focus on the really big numbers, right, like impressions or page views on a website, because you know, as, as communicators, right, these huge numbers make it seem like we're, we're being really successful. And, you know, that's cool, but reach is one of those big numbers, and it's used on Facebook Insights. Reach is a number of like unique people who have seen your post as it floats by in their in their graph or in their their stream, along with posts from their friends and posts from their favorite bands and mom and dad and everybody else. Uh, so we're not totally convinced that seeing a post float by actually means much. So what we're trying to look at is is actual engagements or people who were you know literally clicking or taking action on a post. So in general, what we're seeing is that for every like thousand customers we reach, we engage about a hundred of them. So that's kind of a rough order magnitude. Uh, that's the ratio for potential versus action. You know, uh, exposing people and what they do with that. To, and we're really trying to figure out how we can tweak our messaging to increase the action side, the clicking, and the interactions with our our information. Now, there are little spikes here and there. You can see stories about you know our, a new per, a purchase of new cars that we're embarking upon, how we're replacing our cloth seats with vinyl, um, you know, on our old trains. Like those those things kind of spike a little bit. But then we have this this massive reach event up around twelve thousand. You can see there toward the top, and the engagement doesn't really track with that. It's like you know what possibly could have caused this. And so uh, I'll tell you what it caused it. Um, it was a picture we threw in almost as an afterthought from the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater. I mean, this is a gorgeous picture, right? On transit, wonderful. Uh, but it was, it was literally almost an afterthought. And on Facebook, it generated our greatest reach, our highest number of engaged users, our highest talk number um, of, of any item by like a factor of five, right? So. I want to just get this straight and kind of frame this up for you. You know, at, at BART, we're dealing with, as, as many of you are, I'm sure, dealing with matters of, of regional importance. We're spending, you know, $890 million on new train cars, okay? We're expanding our schedule. We're, we're celebrating 40 years of service this, this, this month. And, you know, all of it is totally trumped by something my colleagues spent 10 seconds doing. So, you know, social media, you are a, uh, a fickle creature. And I, I think the challenge is understanding what this medium is for our customers, what they want from this medium, and what, what uh, they want to interact with there, how we can better place ourselves in that space with our content, with our tone, with our visuals, which I think are, are often overlooked. Um, so that's kind of the, the takeaway here. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about roadmap here. Um, you know, this is this is kind of the outline of the path, at least that that we've taken, and I think most of us will take. I think to a fully actualized social media presence. And you know, as the checkboxes indicate, we're we're not all the way there, at least here at Bart. I think simple broadcasting and listening to 
uh, listening to customers is kind of the first step. Many of us are doing that. Um, responding, you know, when we're available, which is typically during just business hours unless you've integrated some kind of call center solution uh, where, you know, there are people on, on, on board longer than just business hours. Um, you know, marketing campaigns is kind of the next step. Our marketing group has used, uh, here at BART, has used Facebook as the centerpiece of promotions for, you know, writer, writer submitted stories and photo contests and, um, you know, polls and stuff like that. But these campaigns have a kind of a discrete beginning and a discrete end, and they don't really integrate with any larger communication strategy. And the, the idea is to try to get all of these tools, all of these channels kind of firing on all cylinders, kind of pointed at the same, at the same message. Uh, so once we get down to these other, this other side, you know, it's about finalizing and promoting internally the social media policy throughout the organization. And as Susan alluded to, we're kind of in that latter group that is using existing personnel policy about, you know, talking about legal issues and uh, talking to the media and stuff like that and kind of stitching together existing policy throughout the organization um, to address social. Um, part of it, too, is that we need to do a better job of inventorying all of our social media accounts, picking the ones that work best for the strategy and parking the rest. You know, we're going to walk away, probably in, put Foursquare into a maintenance mode, for example. Um, developing content strategy, that's, that's key because we're looking at pushing messaging through a lot of different channels and you can have individuals in those channels kind of creating the, that messaging or you can take a more holistic approach to create messaging that works uh, and formatted um, throughout each of those channels and that's something that we need to work on here. And then kind of prioritizing the rollout. I think uh, some agencies have integrated their call center into uh, Twitter uh, really well, and that's something that we're going to be working on uh, here at BART because, you know, essentially, I, I, some of you probably saw that study in Chicago, which is, you know, really no surprise. Twitter fundamentally is a customer services channel, and, um, you know, it has the potential to be negative in that regard because, of course, no one is going to call you on the phone or call your customer services group and say, hey, you guys really met my expectations today. You know, you really did a great job. Um, typically, you're going to hear the negative stuff, and in order to, to clear the way and get that stuff addressed so that other communicators can, can work within the Twitter space, you really need uh, the customer services group stepping up into that area. So beyond that, uh, software solutions for social tasks like listening and publishing and posting and that sort of thing, that, that's also part of it. I'm running a, a little bit short of time, so I'm going to move on. Um, just really briefly to our organizational model. Um, you know, we're pursuing this hub-and-spoke approach where the communications department is kind of the lead and we're going to try to um, push out, you know, policy, train individuals throughout uh, the organization, training, best practices, kind of emanate from the center of excellence, I guess, or perhaps more like aspiring excellence. Um, we're taking this distributed approach to social media because you know, we feel like social media gurus, like the one person, can't really scale very well. I, I've seen agencies hire people to just to kind of like take care of social media, and that's really not the way we're headed. We're, when we look at real return and value, it's hard to kind of uh, sell headcount for social media in the, in the E-suite. So we're, what we're trying to do is create these subject matter experts who are trained and able to create communities of engagement on their own in the social space um, and allow them to do, their, to do their jobs there. I think the other thing, too, is what we're seeing is new people coming into the organization, planners, um, people in our access group who expect to engage with their customers and their stakeholders in the social space, and we want to try to enable that. Um, okay, so finally, in parting, uh, picking your channels totally key. Uh, making sure you focus on what matters to your customers. Uh, you know, research can really reveal a lot of unexpected things, like the fact that people didn't mind the automated Twitter feed. So that's that's important to keep in touch with your customers in that way. Uh, trying to get into tracking stuff that actually matters, metrics that mean something to your organization, keeping social in perspective, of course. And then this, you know, what we're finding is that scaling up, scaling 
uh, social entity organization is really a marathon. It's not a sprint. I think it fundamentally it requires a lot of um, kind of a fundamental shift in uh, how your organization does business, and it's a cultural shift as well. And uh, it's keeping up the good fight trying to make that happen. So I'm going to pass this over to Judy again. Thank you so much for your time and, uh, and your attention here today. Thank you very much, Timothy. I hope your voice is holding up. Morgan Lyons is Director, Media Relations for DART, Dallas Area Rapid Transit. He is responsible for the agency's external and internal communications programs. Lyons manages DART's internet websites and social media platforms. He is Chair of the Authorization Task Force of APTA's Marketing and Communications Committee and was previously chair of the Telling Our Story Task Force of the Marketing and Communications Committee. He holds undergraduate and graduate degrees from Baylor University and a graduate degree from the University of Iowa. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to visit with you for a few minutes to talk about how, uh, how DART's been using uh, social media uh, really as part of our, of our overall uh, program. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of a background about what we've been doing because uh, picking up where, where, where Tim uh, and, and Susan were going is really social media becomes part of the larger uh, toolkit, if you will, of, uh, of communication with our customers and with our stakeholders. I think one of the things, uh, one of the big lessons we have learned as we've been moving into uh, into social media is that it is really about uh, the need for or meeting, responding to the need for community. Uh, Susan used a, a statistic early on about uh, two-thirds of uh, all online adults are using some form of social media. Now, Facebook is the, uh, is the largest uh, single social media tool out of that bunch, Twitter, about 15% of them use Twitter, but when you when you dig in and you understand why the Facebook users are there, they're they're talking about the connections and the relationships. Uh, they are connecting with family members. They are connecting with uh, people that they grew up with that they haven't seen in forever. They are staying in contact with uh, people uh, that they have just met. They are creating their own. Uh, if you will, Morgan community, uh, their own specific community. And one of the opportunities and one of the challenges for us as transit uh, providers, as transit entities, is to find a way to uh, not only access their community but create a real sense of community among transit users and transit advocates and transit champions. So that, that's really kind of where, where we're going and uh, where I think as a, as a group we, we need to, to head. So all of this kind of fits together. Uh, one thing I would say is that uh, email has been declared dead uh, more than any number of characters on, on uh, bad vampire movies or The Walking Dead, but 85% of uh, internet users are using email. I mean, it's still the dominant uh, communications tool, so it's still there, and it's got to be part of the part of the conversation. Um, let me kind of set up what we're doing and how all of this fits together. Uh, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily say they're social media tools, but we really want everything to work together. So uh, as part of our initial strategy when we got into this, uh, which was to continue speaking uh, with one voice and engaging in conversation with a, a single uh, voice. It's not a matter of us just talking to people, but when people are communicating back to us, they're getting official, real uh, human information, but they're getting, they're getting the real deal, not, not some of the noise that you can get out of the social spaces. Um, we have sites in English and Spanish. We have a mobile site, as you see on this graphic. 
The mobile site is actually uh, platform neutral. Uh, we don't have an app. Uh, it, uh, we, we built a standalone mobile site, m.dark.org, because we wanted people to be able to, to use it uh, however they wanted. Uh, and that, uh, we've had that since 2007, August of 2007. And that in and of itself generates uh, about 650,000 page views a month. So it's, it's pretty busy for us. We've also developed a number of in-transit tools initially for the mobile site, but we found from our customers that they would translate well to the desktop site. Again, it's a matter of delivering information to customers and, and letting customers communicate with us in the channels that, that they choose, uh, rather than us saying, you can have any color you want, but it's going to be black. Um, the social media websites, our three primary, our three are Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. Um, we have been on, on Facebook since July 2009, Twitter since December 2008, and YouTube since July 2008. Uh, and you see examples, uh, screen captures from uh, each of those. Uh, YouTube and Twitter uh, have become probably more powerful to us than we initially thought. Um, we, uh, uh, we're active in, in all of them, but uh, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time in a second talking about YouTube uh, and, uh, and Twitter. Facebook is still a little bit of a puzzle for us, frankly. Um, again, that is, it's the most popular place for adults using um, online media or social media, but uh, particularly with their site redesign of several months ago, uh, it, it's kind of hard to know which ends up and what the relative value of a like is. I was in a meeting this morning where we were talking about Facebook and uh, someone made a comment that you know, Facebook's even struggling with, with that. They post, somebody had posted something about their father dying and the next thing you knew there were ten likes. Well, that's terrible, but, you know, so is that, what does that like mean? Um, and so I think we're still kind of struggling with how to really uh, engage the, the Facebook community, which is significant, and engage them in a meaningful uh, way. Uh, you see some numbers for us and, and uh, uh, kind of how we're using the different tools. I show you the front page of the website because we did a site redesign about a year ago, and one of the things we did very intentionally was pull the social media tools to prominent places on the uh, on the website. Again, connecting all of the uh, all of the components. Uh, you know, we've got them on the top right, in the uh, in the middle uh, third, and and again down at the uh, the bottom. So you really it's it's hard to avoid the social tools that uh, that Dart that Dart has. Um, one of the things that uh, Susan spent a good bit of time in the study was talking about how we were using YouTube, and this was back in uh, in 2009 and 2010, uh, and it was a project we developed. Uh, called I'm Connected to the Green Line. And I see some of the folks on the, the call here um, have, been, have, have heard me do some of this at some of the after meetings. Uh, but basically the, uh, the idea behind it was twofold. One, uh, from a communicator standpoint, is we wanted to understand YouTube. Um, one of the things we had observed was that the channels, the YouTube, or the YouTube providers, we'll say, that remained viable, remained popular, remained productive, were producing uh, quality content on a consistent basis. They were, they were publishing regularly. Uh, so many times you see people, and it's, it's true of all the different uh, social media sites, uh, they set up an account and they post a couple of times, and then they're gone. And the, and the, the Internet is just covered over with, with folks like that. So we wanted to understand uh, what we could get out of YouTube. So we wanted to look for a way to, to provide a steady stream of, of good content. The other part from an internal uh, standpoint is we were building the Green Line, which was a huge project for us, a 28-mile light, light rail line. 
uh, and we wanted to communicate that externally, but we also wanted to engage our employees and, and, and brag about our employees. And so we did a series of interviews with employees who were involved in the Green Line and we later branched out to customers and stakeholders to talk about how they were connected to the Green Line. It's all connected with the, the theme line of the, of the total Green Line campaign. And, and it, so for an 18 month period, we were providing uh, weekly updates, uh, weekly fresh, fresh material each week using the, uh, the YouTube channel. And, and it was very popular. We did an initial call out to our employees uh, through our managers to identify folks who would be comfortable uh, on camera. And again, we use consumer grade equipment. We have an excellent AV group, uh, but uh, we didn't use them. Uh, we used one of the folks in the communications group, gave them a, a, a camera from one of the big box stores and produced the video a couple of minutes long and, and put them to work. It's just one of the other things they were doing. They found, found out that they were incredibly popular with the employees. We used them in other channels throughout the agency internally to build excitement and enthusiasm for the project. And so we never had to ask again. Uh, we kept getting people, hey, I'd like to be a part of that. Uh, I know so and so. Have you talked about uh, bringing bringing them on the uh, this particular program? And so. The big learning for us from that exercise was that people really like video. Now that's kind of the painfully obvious comment of the of probably the entire webinar. But let me put that in some context for you. YouTube, YouTube tells us that about 72 hours of video, fresh video, are uploaded to YouTube every minute. I want you to hold on to that thought for just a second. 72 hours of fresh video every minute. In 2011, it was 48 hours. So think about that. three days worth of video being added every minute to uh, YouTube. Now, granted, a lot of that is video of somebody's cat chasing a laser light or whatever, but people just keep wanting to go to it. So. As we built the site, we wanted to take advantage of what we knew customers wanted and how they wanted to receive information and engage with us, and that was through video. And so we built a, a screen, as you see on the front page, uh, that's kind of right in the big center. Uh, you see somebody standing up there. That's actually one of the videos we created for the opening of the, uh, of the orange line. Uh, and, and so it was just... That has, was a huge learning for us. Uh, the next part for us is how we can incorporate video as we move forward. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is creating a daily news service uh, where we can become more intentional in our communication and more social in our communication so we're really delivering dark news on a daily basis. And we still have a few logistics to, to work through um, on that. Um, and so that's really kind of the next thing for us because we found that there's a huge demand for darts-focused information within this community of transit users here in North Texas. Let me run through a couple of other things because I'm getting close to the end of my time as well. Uh, we began using RSS, uh, really simple syndication, which was probably the first social media tool uh, back uh, for us back in 2005. And the adoption rate remains probably uh, 8 to 10 percent among Internet users. It may not be that high. It's a little bit of a geeky thing. But the people who use it absolutely love it. Uh, that way they are able to follow the information they want. They get the news that they want. They can attend to the messages they like. And Gov, this Gov delivery to, to give them a, a, a plug uh, is really the, is the, the back office tool that we use for uh, email. We based what we learned from the RSS feeds um, when we went to this system, uh, which allows people to select the kind of information they're getting. Because social media is all about choice. The customers are going to tell you what they want. It's not a matter of blasting a trillion news releases out uh, via email and hope somebody gets it. This is self-selected 
information on the part of the uh, of the customers. Um, we have currently right now, and I mentioned the email at the beginning, about 22,000 subscribers uh, and, and about 10 subscriptions per subscribers with a large number of, of, uh, of items. And you see the number of emails that we've, we've delivered. Uh, they do that through uh, a tool that, again, is on the front page of the website, MyDart Updates. And again, it puts information in their hands, and the objective is to give it to them in a way that they can share it, um, which actually leads us to the use of the mobile site. And, and how is that all connected? Well, if you look at any research, you find that we are an increasing, uh, increasingly Internet use is based on mobile tools, and social media use is based on mobile tools. And, and if you have to have a presence in the social media space on a mobile platform. Um, that this is something that we were able to build in house, and again, it's a way of delivering information because one of the things that we've learned over the past few years is that customers are interested in the information about their specific service, and if they're not getting it, they're going to tell you about it. Now, when they're in the social spaces, they're going to be telling their however many followers they happen to have. And so it's been important for us to deliver information in a, in a micro level to customers. Uh, Where's My Bus is, a, is one of the apps we, did, we developed that uh, lets people find uh, just information where they can track their bus in real time. Again, Where's My Dark Stop? and some tools that we're developing for what we euphemistically refer to as underachieving phones here. Uh, and those are text tools. Uh, we uh, put a text service in place a, a little over a year ago. Again, it's to let uh, customers obtain specific information about the bus that they want. Uh, we're not the biggest system in the country, but you know we're a big size, a big system. And so they can get next bus information in real time. They can get next scheduled train information via text. Uh, soon they'll be able to get real time train information. And again, it's about giving them customized information, which is an essential part of understanding the social media experience. Uh, we added a second phase to the text service in April, which is a police text, where customers can communicate to us uh, about problems they see on their trains and buses at the stations without calling us because they don't want to draw attention to themselves. Uh, and we've actually, that's, that's new, but uh, we actually feel very good about how that's, uh, how that's gotten off to a good start. Again, providing tools to customers, which is what the social media experience is all about. Uh, anyway, what's next? Uh, where's my train? I mentioned that. We're also looking at a ticketing application. We think that actually leads us in to some other social media opportunities. Uh, we're developing some, some mobile tools, next stop information, again, empowering customers and delivering information on their sites uh, and, and or to their particular needs. I'll wrap up by thanking the folks who are actually the brains behind all of this, Elizabeth Elam and Lawrence Sutton, who developed the tools and make all of this work. My job is to really just kind of stay out of their way, uh, and they make all of this possible. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to shoot me an email. Whatever we can do to help, we're glad to do it.